Okay, Bismillah. So this is Makkah Mukarramah, uh, the time of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, or four thousand years ago. So at that time, Mecca was an isolated valley and it was mountains located, no trees, no water. There wasn't anything in Mecca. So at that time, Prophet Ibrahim was told to take his wife Hajar and his son Ismail to Mecca. He erected that tent for his family and then he went back to Palestine. He left his family in the desert knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take care of them. So a few days later, Hajar ran out of water. She was running between Asafa and the Marwa. She was looking for a caravan or water. So after she had taken several miles between these two mountains, he came down and struck his wing onto the ground. And subhanAllah, the water started gushing out from there. And she was trying to stop. She was saying Zamzam. That means stop, stop. And that's what we call it, Zamzam. The first tribe to settle in Mecca is a many tribe called Jurf. The people of Jurfam used to go to Syria on business. On the way back to Yemen, they used to rest behind the mountain of the base, almost there. So they used to stop there for rest. One day they saw birds flying over the valley. They knew there was water in there. So they came down to the valley, found Hajjit, Ismail, and the wives. They wanted to stay permanently in Mecca, so they asked Hajjit for permission. Hajjit accepted that, but she had one condition. She just wanted to be responsible for the water. Prophet Ibrahim used to visit his family once in a while. During one of those visits, Allah commanded him to rebuild the cabin. The cabin was built by Prophet Adam alayhi salam originally. When Ibrahim came to Mecca, there wasn't anything. The floods had already destroyed it. That is why the Kaaba is not shown in the first map. You know what's that? Yeah. The Kaaba is not shown there. Because when Ibrahim came to Mecca the first time, the Kaaba was completely mm -hmm. destroyed. So uh, around 300 years after Ismail's death, another tribe called Zah conquered Mecca. And the leader of that tribe, Amr bin Luhayb, became the ruler. Amr bin Luhayb brought the idols to Mecca. So because of him, the people became idol worshippers or pagans. And that's when paganism started in Mecca Mukarram. The descendants of Ismail were banished from Mecca. So they moved to the surrounding valleys. Around 200 years before the Prophet was born, Qusay bin Kalab gathered these people from the other valleys. They conquered Mecca and Qusay became the ruler. By the way, Qusay is the Prophet's great, great grandfather. So the people of Quraysh or the descendants of Ismail took over against. Okay? And then we have Mecca Mukarramah at the time of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, 1400 years ago. See that wall around the Kaaba? That wall was like a boundary. No one was allowed to build anything within the wall. That building is called God and Nezal. It was like a parliament or a meeting house where the leaders used to have their meetings. Mm -hmm. That one. This is Abdullah's house where Nabi Muhammad was born and raised. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's house. And this is Dar Arqam. Dar Arqam is a companion. His house was like a hideout or a secret yes, school. Yes, yes. Remember, Sahabas used to meet there and study Islam secretly. Okay? This is the key of the Kaaba. It is oh, wow. the, the original one. Yes. The key of the Kaaba is it changed every few years. So this is the one which was used in the 70s, around 40 years ago. Right behind here, we have... Uh, the so is that the... This cloth. is the actual cloth of the Kaaba. Yes. Is that that one? Yes. Right behind here, we have this cloth. This, this cloth uh, from the Kaaba as well. It is 230 years. 230. 35 actually. Yeah. Here we have the stages of the Kaaba. So the Kaaba was built by Prophet Adam, uh, peace be upon him. When Ibrahim came to Mecca, there wasn't anything. The floods had already destroyed it. It was completely destroyed. Prophet Ibrahim was told to rebuild. So he made it 15 meters by 10 meters. Okay. He made it roofless and he made two doors forward. Around 2,500 years later, that this Kaaba here was damaged, so the Prophet's family wanted to rebuild it. They decided to use halal money, pure money. They didn't have enough, and that is why they made it smaller, 10 by 10. The actual size 15 by 10, not 10 by 10. So they put the salmon circle next to it to make it 15 by 10 meters. The salmon circle is called Hijr. Some people call it Hatim. So now when you do top, you must do it from the outside, not in between. When you are in that area, it's like you are inside the Kaaba, and that is why that 
Nigeria is always part of Abdullah bin Zubayr rebuilt the Kaaba after the death of the Prophet. He was told that the Prophet had wanted to make the Kaaba on the foundations of Ibrahim. He wanted to uh, fulfill the Prophet's wish, and that is why he returned it to the original size, 15 by 10 meters. A few years later, in the Hajjah, the rule of Iraq, he came to Mecca and put back the Hebrew. He thought that the Kaaba was changed, and that is why he put back the Hebrew. And the Kaaba has been like this ever since. The Turks made it higher or taller, and then King Fahad renovated the Kaaba in 1997, around 20 years ago. Any questions about that? The grandfather of the prophet made about, uh, he said, Oh, if you give me ten sons, I will sacrifice one of them in return. He had only one son and he made that promise. So when he had ten sons, he wanted to thank Allah by slaughtering one of them. So he drew lots, like, you know, they would write the names on arrows and they would randomly choose one of them. So Allah, the one who was chosen to be sacrificed was the prophet's father, Abdullah. Abdullah was Abdul Muttalib's most beloved son. Okay. So sacrificing him was really hard. People of Paris told him, go to Yathrib and seek some advice there. There was a wise woman, a fortune teller in Medina. So that lady told him to sacrifice camels. He slaughtered under camels and he gave it to the poor people. When Abdullah was 25 years old, he got married and Amina was pregnant. Abdullah was on a journey to Isham, Syria. On the way back to Mecca, he stopped over in Medina. He was there with Sikh in Medina, and that is why he couldn't make it uh, make it to a Kamkam. So the uh, Abdullah the Prophet's father died here in Al Medina. <laughs> You know him? Yeah. That's yeah. her, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, that's Abra, the Kadim, yes. the Jam of Yemen. Uh -huh. Abra built a church in Yemen and he wanted all the Arabs to go to the church to worship Allah there. The Arabs did not follow his orders. Uh, moreover, one of the Arabs went to the church and defiled it by defecating inside it. Yes. And that is why Abraham wanted to, to, to destroy their sacred house, mm -hmm. the Kaaba. He had a huge army and one elephant. Shriya said that the elephant's name is Mahmoud. Many people tried to stop Abraham's army on the Mecca. They couldn't because the army was extremely strong. When the army arrived in Mecca, the birds of Allah appeared from nowhere. In a dark cloud, the small birds overshadowed the entire army. We called them Ababi. Ababi. Each bird had three songs. They threw them on the army. In just minutes, the whole army was destroyed. And that year is called the year of the elephant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's stop. Okay. Yeah, that finishes the carry on. Yeah, you see, he was born pure, clean, already circumcised. His mother said when the baby came pregnant with him, told that he gave birth to him, I never felt any pain. SubhanAllah, his grandfather didn't really care with him to the Kaaba, where he thanked Allah for the baby and he named him Muhammad. When the Nabi was six years old, his mother took him to Medina Munawara to see his maternal uncle. One month later, his mother died on the way back to Mecca. She died in an abuwa that was in between Mecca and Medina, around 180 kilometers. So by the time he was six, he had lost his parents. Yes. See the red sofa here? This one here? Red you sofa. Know? Yeah. This one here was like a, well, it was for Abdul Muttalib. It was like a throne. No one was allowed to sit on that sofa with Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib used to let the Nabi sit on it, and he used to say to the people, this is my son Muhammad, and he will be imported in the future. Adam al had been told that his grandson would be a great leader, and that is why he used to treat him that way. When the Nabi was eight years old, his grandfather died. Okay, so he became an uncle for the third time. His uncle Abu Talib became his guardian. Abu Talib wanted to take him to Asham to teach him business. He wanted him to be a businessman. So on the way to Asham, a priest recognized the mark on the back of the palm. He called the same the Prophet. The priest saw that mark. He knew that would be a prophet, so he told Abu Talib to take his nephew back to Mecca and to keep it over the Jews. A lot of them are in the sham, and that's what the priest is afraid of. He was afraid that the Jews might kill him 
probably will do bad things to me. So like I said, he was 12 years old. So five years later, and then you receive, uh, sorry, uh, he was 12 years, yeah. When he was 25 years old, you know, like, you know, the people, they would call him an enemy, the trustworthy. Mm -hmm. At that time, Khadija was the richest woman in Mecca. She used to hire men to trade on her behalf in Syria. Mm -hmm. So she hired him not because he was so good at it, no. She hired him because he was the trustworthy. Mm -hmm. She promised him that she would give him half the profits. So on the way to Hashem, a priest saw a Nabi sitting under a dad's tree. The priest asked Mesa. Mesa was, Mesa. was Khadija's servant. Mm -hmm. Mesa said, that's Muhammad, Muhammad bin Abdullah. Mesa said, you know, the priest said to Mesa, no one sits under that tree but Allah's messenger. That's the Jordan right now, isn't it? They say that. Okay. And when it was hot, Mesa would see two angels of the Prophet, that they were shading him, protecting him from the sun. So Mesa told Khadija about the angels and the priest. He also told her about the Prophet's character. She was amazed by that. She wanted to marry the Prophet, so she's the one who proposed. The Prophet accepted that even though she was 15 years older. They had six children, two sons and four daughters, but the sons couldn't survive. They were very young when they died. Yeah. Right behind the year, when the Nabi was 35 years old, the people of Quraysh wanted to rebuild the Kaaba. Look at that. All the families participated. Everything went on in harmony. But when it came to place in Hajj al-Aswad, every family wanted to do that. No? So the people were fighting over it, actually. The oldest amongst them came. Came and said to the people, this is not the way we should do it. Let's wait here. And the first one who enters into the sanctuary where we let him decide. Yes. It was yes. the name of yes. yes. The people were very glad it was him because they knew that the prophet was wise and just. They knew that he was going to, to make everyone happy. That is why they were very glad it was him. So Nabi asked for that cloth. He spread it out. He placed the hadith in the center. Then he said, I need one representative for each family. And then he asked the representatives of the families to carry to the corner together. And he took al hajj with the cloth himself, and he put it so much in its place. This is all the families participated in tracing it, and that shows how wise he was, the wisdom he has. So five years later, you received the first hajj. Is it here? Yes. Yeah. Ikra. So this is Jabal al -Nur. Up there we have got a head where the Prophet is to contemplate. Mm -hmm. He would spend days, sometimes weeks, so when he was 40, he received the first ayah. In the beginning of the Dawah, the Prophet was told to preach privately or secretly. This is the house where they would meet. It wasn't between the Safa and the Marwa, but it was closer to the Safa. So after three years of preaching privately, the Prophet was told to announce it publicly, to go out and spread Islam. The people of Quraysh couldn't take it because the number of the Muslims was rising. They wanted to stop him, Salaam, so they killed some of his companions. They hurt some of them, and they couldn't protect the Sahabas because Allah had not given him permission to fight back at that time. And that is why he told them to migrate to, to Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Ethiopia, thank you, sir. Yes. So the Sahabas were told to go there because the ruler was wise and he was just and kind hearted. Yes. Around 100, and com 100 companions migrated to Abyssinia, including the Manafan and his wife, and his wife and the Prophet's daughter, Muslim Nurmain, and many, many Sahabs. Yes. The people of Quraysh sent their invoice with a lot of gifts to the king. They wanted him to send the Sahabas back to Makkah Mukarrama. The king was just, and that is why he refused to send them back to Makkah Mukarrama. And by the way, the king ended up becoming a Muslim. Yeah. You know, some of the Sahabas stayed there for one year, like Abdul, like Uthman uh, and his wife, uh, the Prophet's daughter, Um Muslim and Abu Salam. And some people who stayed there for over 10 years, like Jafar bin Talib, Um Habib. You know, when the Nabi was 47 years old, yeah. the people of Quraysh decided to kill him. Yeah. They couldn't take it anymore. Yes. SubhanAllah, Banu Hashim, that's the Prophet's family, uh -huh. they stood up by him. Yes. They supported him, even though many of them were not Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's not about religion now, it's about family. So the other families in Makkah Mukarrama boycotted the Prophet's family. They decided not to sell food to the family of Nabi, not to buy food from, you know, from his, his, like, from, from his family. It was real hard to be in his, in his family, and that's why they had to leave the city. They went to the valleys of the where food and water were very limited. The boycott was written on it, he looked at it there. They wanted to make it more binding upon themselves, so they put it inside the camp. They, they hung it all the way to the camp. Three years later, look at that, 
the boycott got oh. eaten by the worms. Yes. Nothing like the name of Allah, Bismillah. And that's when the boycott yes. ended. You know, in that year, Khadija and Abu Talib died. They were his strongest supporters, and that is what we call it the year of sorrow yeah. or the year of silence. Yeah. Abu Talib, you know, after the death of Abu Talib, and Nabi went to a five. The five is around 100 kilometers from Mecca. The Nabi thought that the people of Taif would accept Islam, but unfortunately they made fun of him, yes. they insulted him, they even threw yes. rocks at him. So, so. so he decided to go back to Mecca Mukarramah. On the way back to Mecca, he passed by a farm. The owners of that farm saw him bleeding under that tree. They wanted to help him, so they told their slave Adas to take some grapes to the prophet. And Nabi said, Bismillah, before eating that. Mm -hmm. Adas was Christian, so he said to the prophet that he had never heard something like that. Nabi Sallallahu asked Adas, where are you from? Adas said, I am from Naina, somewhere in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So Nabi said to Adas, Naina, what is the land of Prophet Yunus? Judah, please be upon him. Adas, like he was shocked, like how do you know our land of Prophet? Yeah. And Nabi presented himself to Adas, said to Adas, Yunus is my brother because he was a prophet, and I'm a prophet too. And that made him a Muslim. Yes. Yes. And when he was, uh, when he was, see, this one here shows Isra and Mi'raj. So this is the first part or the first light. It's the journey of the Prophet Sallallahu from Mecca to Palestine. You know, you know, you know yes. Burak? Burak is like a winged horse. Mm -hmm. It carried the Nabi all the way to Palestine where he led all the Prophets of Allah Sallallahu and then he ascended to the heavens. And Nabi came back and told all the people in Mecca about it. He thought that the people in Mecca would accept Islam, but they made fun of him. They said like, it takes us one month to go there. Yeah. Now you're saying this took you one night. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't believe that Abaka, yeah. and that is why we call him as Siddiq, you know, yeah. the truthful one. He is the first one to believe in Israel. And uh, she's at the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, Mr. Dome of the Rock. Inshallah, yeah. we're, we're going to talk about okay. this. See, uh, when the Nabi was 52 years old, he met the people from Medina Munawar in Al Aqab. Mm -hmm. Those people uh, were performing Hajj. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them about Allah's revelations. Yes. They immediately recognized him as the messenger who was mentioned in the Jewish scriptures. Okay. You know, the Jews uh, had been living in Medina Manor for over yes. 1,500 years. So the people, they, they, they knew it was him. The people who were in Mecca, they were not Jews, by the way. They were idol worshippers. Obviously, they had heard from the Jews. Mm -hmm. So they accepted Islam. And then they said to the Prophet, we are new. We don't know that much, that much about Islam. So we need one of your companions to preach us, to teach us proper Islam. Mm -hmm. And that is what we call him the first ambassador in Islam. And then the people of the Munawara promised him, they said, inshallah, next year, we'll come back with more people. The following year, 72 people came to Mecca with Musa. All of them were Muslims, and all of them gave an oath of allegiance to the Prophet Is that where Masjid al Bayah is? Yes, al Bayah. Yeah, near Jamras, isn't it? That's true. It's a mosque now. It's a masjid. SubhanAllah. The, the people of the Munawar were the first people to stand up by his message, and that is why the Prophet called him yes, an Ansar, yes. helper or supporter. So after that, the Sahabas of the Nabi were told to migrate to Medina Munawar. You see, they were divided into small groups, and they were told to take different routes. Any idea why? Um, so it would be hard for the Muslims yeah. to track them down. And by the way, it took them around 12, sorry, two, around six days, six to seven days to arrive in the Medina. And Nabi didn't join the Sahabas because Allah had not told him to yes, go to yes, Medina. Yes. He was in Mecca Mukarama awaiting Allah's permission. So when he was told to go there, the people of Quraysh knew about it. They knew that Nabi had decided to migrate to Medina Munawara, and that is why they wanted to kill him. Look at that. See, 40 assassins were told to kill him. They didn't want to break in because the Prophet's daughters are in the house. Mm -hmm. And Nabi went past them. They couldn't see him leaving the house. It's like Allah blocked his messenger from their side. And then he was reciting what Janim bin Adim said that. And the Kalfim said that, yeah, we have made a barrier before them and a barrier behind them so they can't see. They couldn't see him leaving the house. See, that's the Prophet's house. He took all the way to Abu Bakr's house. And both of them decided they headed south. They decided to go to the cave of Thor. Thor is in the south, but Medina is in the north. And Nabi Abu Bakr knew that the search would be in the north. And that's why they decided to hide in the south. The best tracker is Surafa. 
You know, the disbelief was worse. They didn't find him in his house. They found Ali Ibn Anu sleeping in the Prophet's bed. They didn't kill him because he was very young. Mm -hmm. The disbelievers couldn't find the Nabi anywhere in Mecca. And that is why they set a prize yeah. of 100 camels on the head of the Prophet. Many trackers were after him. The best tracker at that time, Surah followed him to the cave. You know, 100 camels, that's a lot of money. Not just any camels, like red camels. Mm -hmm. Best, best camels. Yes. Camels, honey. So Surah followed him to the cave, but he was surprised once he got there. You know, the spider web was over the entrance. And the pigeon and the nest, like they were right in front of the entrance. Yes. When Surah I saw that web, he couldn't believe that someone was hiding inside. At that time, they used to know things. For example, a web is there and it's not broken, so obviously no one is inside. Yes. I don't have to go in there and look for anything. And that's when Surah went back to the Kurma. For Nabi Abu Bakr, they stayed in the cave for a few days. That's why Bakr's daughter was going to provide food and water for them. So the story, the story of the cave is true. But the story of the spider web and the pages is debatable. They have different opinions about it. And here we have the Mizl Aqsa. Wow. So the whole the whole thing is called the Mizl Aqsa or the Haram Aqsa. Mm -hmm. Within the wall, you've been there, right? I've not been there. No. Okay. No. Within the wall, we have around five masjids. Uh -huh. These two are the most famous ones. Masjid Domo the Rock is the only mosque that we see on TV. Yes. It's it's not a lot, so it's Domo the Rock. That's where the Prophet ascended to Allah from. From there, okay? Yes. And uh, that's why it's called Masjid Domo the Rock. That one is a Masjid Al Aqsa. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people call it that way. And it's also called Qibli. Qibli comes Qibli. from Qibli, yeah. It comes from Qibli. It's the first Qibli. Yeah. So this is Masjid Qibli. Yes. And that's Domo the Rock. Masjid Qibli, where the Prophet led all the Prophet of Allah, where he led the prayer. Yes. So uh, the point is, the Dhamma Rock is the only message that you see on me. Uh -huh. That is the most famous message of us. Yes. The whole thing is called the Hamas. It doesn't matter whether you pray inside or outside, you need to miss it. You're going to be the same idea. Right. The same way you want. You see this wall here? This one. Yep. Yeah. This wall, this one. This one. Oh, yes. This is the waiting wall where the Jews oh, the pray, Jews. where they well. Yeah. Muslims call it Al Burak wall. Al Burak was tied to that wall, and that's why we call it Al Burak wall. Yes. Okay. And here we have Al Qaswa. Al Qaswa. Is, that's true. That's true. It's a female, or a female camel or a yes. she camel. Nabi Sallallahu bought it from Abu Bakr for yes. 400 dirhams. Wow. She was only four years old when he bought it. So she stayed with him for 11 years. When the Nabi died. This camel became very, very sad. Like she was crying all the time. She couldn't comprehend it. And that is why she got blind. You see, she became blind. That's true. Not only that, she stopped eating and drinking. And that is why she died around 20 to 28 days after the Prophet's death. She couldn't live longer. She was only 15 years old when she died. Camels usually for 30 to 35 years. So she was really young. So this camel here carried the Nabi all the way to Medina during Hijrah. She participated in many battles, such as Badr and the camp of yes. Mecca. In addition, the Nabi performed Hajj. He was 60 to 63 years yep. old, so he performed Hajj on that camel, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are these, are these graves? Yeah, yeah that's Baqi, where oh, okay. he used to stay. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right next to Baqi. Mm -hmm. And here we have Yatri. Yathrib is the old name from Medina. Yeah, from Medina. Yathrib actually was one of the grandsons of Prophet Nuh now He came to Medina more than six thousand years ago and the city was named after him. So Yathrib has a bad meaning in Arabic to blame someone and that is going to be changed the name of the city to Medina Munawara. The first to tribe to settle Medina Munawara, the tribe of Amali, the city of Amalekites. Yes. They used to live in the north side of the city. And then we have the Jews. The Jews came to Medina with the camp of Nabi Moses uh, around 3,000 years ago. These tribes are Bani Nadir, Bani Qainuqa, and Bani Qurayza. They just had agreements, pacts with the Prophet They didn't accept the sun because the Nabi was not one of them. So from left to right, yes? Bani Nadir, mm -hmm. Bani Qainuqa, and Bani yeah. Okay. So after breaking all these agreements, mm -hmm. some of these people were banished, some of them were killed. All a few people accepted the sun. Okay, and then we have here the Prophet's journey to Medina, like you know, this is uh, Hijrah. Yes. You know, along the way to Medina, there are many, many stories 
Some of these stars are authentic, and some of them are not. The most famous ones are these two, the Sultan from Mabed and the Sultan of the Mali. Umar Mabed was a very, very generous lady. And Nabi Nabukar Siddiq came to her tent asking her for something. She didn't have anything. And Nabi saw that goat in the corner. He asked Umar Mabed about it. She said to him, this goat is very old and there is no milk in it. He said, can I milk it? She said to him, it's almost dying. So he asked Nabi, can I milk it? She said, it's very old, there is no milk in it. So he asked her the third time. Yeah. And then she said, you can do that. And Nabi Sallallahu said, oh Allah, bless the goat of Umar Mabed. He said, Bismillah. And then he started touching the goat, like he wiped over the other, and it filled with milk. Yes. So all of them had milk, and Nabi Umm Ma'bad and everyone who was with them. And Nabi, um, and Nabi Rabbi Kristi gave Umm Ma'bad a bowl of milk before leaving the tent. Yes. So when her husband came back, he saw that milk. He said, like, where did you get it from? Because there wasn't anything when I left. She said, a blessed man, by Allah, a blessed man was here. So he said, describe him to me. Yes. To describe Nabi Sallallahu yes. This description of Umar Mabad is still there. Yes. On YouTube, on Google, and the books of Syria, it's the best one. Okay? okay. And the second story here is the story of Suraka al Suraka was the best tracker at okay. the time. He didn't have any personal issues with the Prophet, nor Abu Bakr. He was after the bounty. He just wanted the bounty. He saw them in the Valley of Jaffa. Yeah. He wanted to capture them. He says, I found them in the middle of and I could see them. So I was, you know, I was getting closer. I got close where I could hear Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reciting the Quran. Wow. Abu Bakr Adana was just looking around, you know, constantly checking, trying to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Suraka says, I drew my spear, I aimed it at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When I was thinking about throwing it, all of a sudden the front legs of my horse sunk into the ground. I backed up my horse, I tried to do it, and again it happened. I tried to do it for the third time, and again it happened. And that's when I knew that Muhammad was a true messenger. So I screamed out towards the Prophet Muhammad, please save me, please stop, Muhammad, save me. And Ibn Bakr Siddiq stopped. Suraka came to the Prophet and he told him everything. He told him that the people of Quraysh had put a price on his head. Now Suraka knew that the Nabi was a true messenger. He knew that the Nabi was divinely protected. He knew that the Nabi was on a mission and nobody yes. could stop him no matter what. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said to Suraka, you just keep our information private, don't tell anyone about us. Yes. And then Suraka said to the Prophet, I want you to write down something for me, uh -huh. something like a note saying that I have your protection. Suraka knew that the Nabi was going to conquer Mecca one day, and that is why he wanted that protection. SubhanAllah, and Nabi also promised him, oh Suraka, you will be given the crown and the bracelets wow. of Kisra. Suraka asked the Nabi, are you talking about the king of Persia? Yes. And Nabi said, yes, I'm talking about the king of Persia. You're going to have his bracelets and his crown as well. Yes. SubhanAllah, for Suraka, that's just something hard to believe in. Yes, yes. You know, eight years later, after the Sahabis had conquered Mecca, Suraka was captured and he was brought to the Prophet yes. And then Suraka showed the Nabi that little patch. He said to yes. the Prophet, do you remember that I have your protection? Mm -hmm. And Nabi said, today is the day of fulfilling promises. And then Nabi said to Suraka, come close. Suraka came close to the Prophet وسلم, and he converted to Islam. Around eight years after his Islam, yes. Suraka was given the crown and the bracelets wow. by Ahmad al Khattab himself. Wow. Suraka, so Suraka is a companion. Yes. So let me show you the root here. Wow. This one. This one here was the main root at that time. The one that the people used to take to the Medina. They used to call it the trade route or the caravan route. And Nabi Nabokar didn't take it because of the bounty. They took another route along the coast. We call it Al-Hijra. So on the left here we have Al-Hijra. Yes. And on the right we have the route of business. They look similar. But believe me, they are completely different in reality. It took Nabi Nabokar around 12 days to arrive in Medina. Okay. The second thing we have here are these volcanoes. Look at these volcanoes. Wow. They are 16 kilometers away from Medina Manawara up 600 kilometers all the way to the east. These volcanoes used to erupt before the birth of the Prophet. That is why we have these volcanic uh, tracks around the scene. I'm gonna show you that. These volcanoes are still there, but they are inactive. The last eruption took place 800 years ago. So let me show you that. The Medina was bounded by volcanic tracks from the west, the east, and the south. 
these volcanic tracks were very, very sharp. You know, it was impossible for the people to enter the city through the lab, you know, due to the sharpness of these, these rocks. That side, or the north side of the city, that was open, no volcanic tracks, nothing was there, was, no, no volcanic tracks, nothing was there, and that is why that side was the main entrance. So the people who would come from Mecca, from the south, they would go around. They would take this valley from the south all the way to the north, and then they would enter the city. Okay? And the Bakr didn't take it because they were afraid that someone might be waiting for them there. They actually entered the city from the south. They had to take a very tight valley in the south called the Ramna. And Nabi was very grateful, so the first thing he wanted to do was salah. Stop right there. He offered to Rakat, thanking Allah for arriving in the Medina with no harm. And then he carried them to Thaniya to Radat, where the people welcomed him. You know, like when the people knew that Nabi had started his journey to Medina Munawwara, they decided to wait for him every day. They would wait every day until midday. So when they saw him there, they started singing Salah al Badru alayna min Thaniya to Radat. After that, Nabi Muhammad took all the way to the houses of Bani Sa'u, where he stayed for a few days. Within those days, he built the first masjid in Islam, Masjid Quba. So these two masjids were not there. Yeah. They had not been built yet. Quba is the first one in Islam. On Friday in the early morning, Nabi Muhammad took all the way to the houses of Bani Salim, where he was commanded by Allah to offer the first Jum'ah, the first Friday of prayer. Yes. SubhanAllah. I said, Masjid Jum'ah. Masjid Jum'ah, yeah. thank you, sir. You know, the Sahabas were there asking the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Oya Rasulullah, come to my house, Oya Rasulullah, come to my house. Everyone wanted to have in his house. Mm -hmm. So Nabi said to the people, where my camel sits, there will be my house. You know, so the Sahabas were following the Prophet's camel, trying to stop it. The camel took all the way to the center. She sat right there with the Prophet, said, here's my house and here's my mosque. That's the Masjid of Shrif, and it's the second Masjid in Islam. The first is Quba, and the second is the Masjid in Medina Shri. See that mountain right there? That Uhud. And this is the train station of the Hijaz. Sorry, this is Uhud, and this is Al Aqib. Al Aqib is a valley. Yeah. So Uhud and Al Aqib are going to be taken to paradise. They're going to be in Jannah. Oh. Nabi says that about these two, yeah. And Nabi also said, Al Medina Munawara is between Eir and Thaw. Eir and Thaw are mountains. Yeah. This is Eir, Thaw. Is a small mountain behind of it. It's behind of it now. So, like, uh, uh, Amin now is a very big city. But this part between Eid and Thaw, this part here, it's called Al Haram. It's called Al Haram. So, this part of the city will be the, will, will become, will be uh, protected when the Dal comes. There will be angels securing Amin Munawar, preventing the Dal from entering the city. So, Medina will be secured as well as Mecca and Mecca. Okay, so any questions about that? So I think we should stop to pray. Yeah. There, there, there were two opinions. Some of the Sahabas wanted to fight within the city. And that was the opinion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The majority of the Sahabas, most of the Sahabas wanted to fight outside the city. Not outside the city. And that is when Prophet decided to go on. Uh, 300 Hittite courts decided not to fight outside. And that is why even the Sahabas were left with only 700. Yeah. Their camp, yeah was in between Uhud and this small mountain. And Nabi saw that mountain in the battlefield, he was afraid of a potential of attack from the rear. He knew that the Sahabas would attack the Muslims from the back. Yes. And that is why he placed 50 archers on that mountain. That's Mount Ruma. Yeah, Ruma, yeah. yeah. They gave them very clear instructions. Instructions, he said, just stay there, stay there, do not come down whether we are winning or losing unless it is very simple. Don't leave your positions unless it is. Yes. And that camp right there is where the disbelievers. They were three thousands, and their leader was Abu Sufyan. So you know the disbelievers actually came here to take revenge. Yeah. They had been defeated at Badr. A lot of them ha had been killed there. They wanted to take revenge. They wanted to kill the public Sahabas. Subhanallah, the initial attack of the Muslims was devastating. It was powerful. The disbelievers could not sustain it, even though they were way outnumbered. So the Muslims were winning and the disbelievers were fleeing. When the archers here saw that, they thought it was over. The enemy is fleeing, so obviously it's done. Yeah. So the archers disobeyed the Prophet's order. They came down to collect the spoils that were in the booty. Uh, yeah, the booty. Khalid bin Walid saw them coming down. You know, He detected the weak point. He wanted to take advantage of that. So Khalid the horsemen out to flag the Muslims. I mean, you see, the other way around. See, they killed the remaining archers. Mm -hmm. He came down 
and then they attacked the Muslims from the back. The rest of the disbelievers came back and joined Khalid. Yes. It was a chaotic state because Muslims were being attacked from both sides, the front and the rear. They were falling one after another, and that's when the Prophet told the Sahabas to retreat to Uhud. Only 12 companions stayed with the Prophet. They were there trying to protect him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of them were killed by Talha. Talha carried the Nabi to that crack where Fatima took care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan, the leader of the disbelievers, thought that the Muslims were trying to go around the mountain and attack his army from behind. He thought it would be a trap. And that's why he told his army to retreat back. History is say there is no winner nor loser because both sides retreated. But when we talk about losses, and even the Sahabas lost 70 out of 700, that's 10 percent. The disbelievers lost only 22 out of 3,000. Yeah. No, that's almost nothing. Because of the archers, many Sahabas were killed. Because because of them, and even was injured, but Allah forgave them all. You know that's mentioned in the Quran. The following day, and even the Sahabas went after the disbelievers. They followed them to Hamra al asr but the disbelievers had already left. And even the Sahabas stayed in Hamra al asr for two days expecting that the disbelievers would come back to fight again. Uh -huh. But the disbelievers didn't come back, and that is why a few historians say that Muslims won the battle. Okay. They went after yes. the disbelievers, and the disbelievers did not come back to fight again. So this is Uhud, I tried to make it as brief as I could. Yeah. If you have any questions, you can ask. Uh, who's buried there? No, the Sahabas? Yes. Our seven to Sahabas. Uh -huh. Like Hamza, Hamzala, you know, uh, Abdullah bin Jahsh, Musa bin Umayyid, Yes, yes, Okay. And then let's talk about the trench. See the disbelievers. Yeah. See the disbelievers collaborated with the Jews to kill the Prophet and the Sahabas. They were 10,000. And then the Sahabas were only 3,000. You know, that's why this battle is also called the Ahzab. And Ahzab confederates or, yeah, or, or tribes. Mm -hmm. They just collaborated to kill the Prophet and the Sahabas. You know, Nabi Yusuf oh. had a shura session with the Sahabas. Salman al Fadis said to the Prophet, In our land, Persia, if we fear the enemy, we will dig a trench. So why won't we dig a trench out of And even the Sahabas liked the idea. You know why? Because Nabi Munawar had a natural protection. Look at that. See these volcanic tracks? Yes. See here in the west, see here, the west, the east, and the south. These volcanic tracks were very strong. And even the Sahabas knew that the disbelievers and the Jews would not have the ability of entering the meeting through the land. Yeah. So they had only that side that was open, and it was the only way for the disbelievers. And that is when even the Sahabas built the trench in the north side of the city from the west to the east. See this wall, this uh, mountain? Yes. Is that one? See, this is the uh, trench. Yes. I'll show you that just, just for a second. See, that's the trench from the West Lava to the East Lava. See, the trench was 2.5 kilometers long, yes. 4.5 meters wide, and 3.5 meters deep. Now, with the old equipment, the machines we have, it takes weeks. But in the middle of the Sahab is finished within six days. Yeah. Seems impossible, but it's the last one. You know, the Jews and the disbelievers were shocked by the trench. Yeah. They couldn't believe what they had, so they couldn't cross over. Forces couldn't jump over either because it was extremely mm -hmm. big. So the Muslims were on this side here, and the disbelievers were on that side. Right. The trench was in between, and that is why there wasn't any fight. They were just throwing rocks and arrows yeah. at each other. A group of the disbelievers could enter the city. But they got killed when the Sahab, by the Sahabas of the Prophet. You know, the trench was there, everything was perfect, but this battle was the hardest and the toughest in the Sahabas because it, it lasts for 29 days. 29 days, the food and the water were very limited. Out of hunger, and Nabi would tie a stone to his stomach. And Nabi made dua eventually. Allah answered his dad by sending a sandstorm to the disbelievers. Which made them retreat back to Mecca Mukarrama. Now this year is called the seven message. Uh, the seven, seven, seven messages. The prophet's uh, so the prophet's army was divided into seven battalions. Each one of them had a message, and that's why we call it the seven messages. And here we have the map. We have the trench. Can you see that? See how big it is. Look at it. See the big rock right there. That rock was very big, so much so that the Sahabas couldn't break. It. Subhanallah, Nabi took a big axe and started hitting that rock. He just hit it three times. Faris, 
He just to hit it three times, but every time he hits it, you know, Allah comes down and a third breaks. From the first, third row, he said I have been given the keys of Syria. I can see the palace of Syria from here, from where I am. From the second, third row, third row, he said I have been given the keys of Persia. I can see the gates of Persia from here. From the third, third row, he said I have been given the keys of Yemen. You know why we were saying that to the Sahabas? Because some of them were first awaited. Like we have been digging for two days now, right? A lot of people are heading towards Medina. Mm -hmm. When these people arrive in Medina, we will not be strong enough to fight back because of the digging. We're going to be tired, exhausted. Probably we're, we're going to lose the battle. We might get killed. Yeah. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, you know, motivating them. He was encouraging them. He was yeah. saying, don't worry about this one here. This is nothing. Because in the future, he will conquer Persia, Syria, and Yemen. And that gave them the strength they needed to finish the trench. They knew that they were going to win this battle. So that's why they, so, they were kind of confident, you know. SubhanAllah. So you hear See, that's, that's the Prophet's camel. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. This is the Medina Munawwara at the time of Nehemiah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi So when he arrived, like, you know, you yeah. know like like the houses of Bani uh -huh. Salim, he said to the people, my camel sits, there will be my house. Yeah. So the Sahabas were following the Prophet's camel, trying to stop it. Oh, wow. The camel took all the way to the center. Yeah. She sat right there where the Prophet said, here is my house and here is my mosque. Yeah. This land here was for two brothers, Sahal and Suhaid. Yeah. They wanted to give it to the Prophet as a present. And they used to accept gifts. But they didn't accept that one because they Same were orphans and they were that's right, and they were very young. And then the Sahab started the building of Masjid al-Sharif. It took them around six months to finish building it. Inshallah, we're going to talk about it. That's Abu Yubal Ansari's house where the Prophet stayed before his houses were built. And these are the houses of the Y, of the companions of the Nabi Now, Masjid al-Sharif covers the whole city. Yes. So we don't just pray in the Masjid al-Nabi. We also pray in the houses of the Sahab. So when you pray there, you will be rewarded. And so will the Sahab because we pray in their houses. Yes. Inshallah. And also we have Baqi. Look at Baqi. The Baqi was outside of Medina, right? The mm -hmm. cemetery. Yeah. yeah, it was outside the city and it was divided into two graveyards. The big one here is called the Baqi. Around 10,000 companions are buried there. And Nabi had 11 wives, nine of them are buried in Baqi, including Aisha. The small one next to it, where the Prophet's aunties are buried. And Nabi had six aunties, three of them were Muslims, Atika, Safiya, and Arwa. They are buried in that area, and that is what the people used to call it that way. Now, these two graveyards are combined, and the Baqiya is five times bigger. You know, 90% of our people are buried in Baqiya. That is why we always have dinners in the house. Did you notice that? We yeah, almost yeah. have dinners after every Salaam house, because whoever dies in Medina goes to Baqiya. You know, by the way, like, you know, being buried in the Medina Munawwara, is, is a blessing. And Nabi says, whosoever is able to die in Medina Munawwara, so let him die there, for indeed I will intercede for those who die in Medina. And he says about the people of Al-Baqiyah, when the judgment day comes, these people of Al-Baqiyah will be shining like full moon and, and they will enter paradise without reckoning. So being buried there is a blessing. May Allah make us one of those. And here, we have a Masjid in Nabu Shiri. You know, at first the Sahabas made it 35 meters by 30 meters. It had two sections or two roofs. This one here was for Salat was in the north because the Qibla was to the Holy Mosque. Of the people used to pray towards Muslims. And the small one here was for the poor. Most of the immigrants, they didn't have houses. Thank you. They didn't have houses. So that part was made for them as a shelter. In the second of the Hijra, and Nabi flipped the roofs. You know why? Because Allah had told him to change the direction to to Mecca. Because in the south, Palestine is in the north, so he had to switch it to 180 degrees. He did not rebuild the masjid, he just flipped the roofs. Look at that one. Now, for Salah, he came in the south, now for the poor, he came in the north, right? And these are the houses of the wives of the Prophet. So, we're going to talk about that. This one here is the first expansion, and it is the only expansion or the only extension in the lifetime of the Prophet. So, so the Sahab has made it 15 by 15 meters. The first Khalifa. Yeah, that's true. In the yeah. seventh, yeah, after the conquest, after, after the, the Khayf, after the battle of Khayf. That's true. Mashallah. Uh, Abu Bakr the first Khalifa, he did not expand the masjid. He just made it stronger by building pillars and columns inside. Second Khalifa Umar Radhiallahu Anhu said, "Umar, Umar Radhiallahu Anhu expanded the mosque from the east and the south 
and he removed the truth. This is done for the poor. Yes. He removed it. He took it away because there were no poor people at all. Okay. It was not needed. Yes. And then the, the third Khalifa, Uthman, Uthman was one of the richest, so he rebuilt the mission. He made it of lava bricks and wood. The previous ones were made of mud bricks and palm leaves. Okay? This is for Walid al Walid al made it 70 by 60 meters. This one here is a very special expression for two reasons. Yeah. See the red box? <coughs> that one here, right there, that's the that's of So wow. this is the first expression that included yeah. the houses. And he built four minarets. Yeah. Khalif al Mahdi here expanded the mosque from the north side. He added these two minarets and he made a well. See that well? Mm -hmm. He made it for wudu. To yeah. wudu. Okay? The rest of the domes were made by Mamluks. They made these domes on purpose. No speakers, no mics. So the domes were like echo system, yeah. you know, acoustics. Uh -huh. And they built a bigger dome to signify the holy chamber. It was silver, but they used to call it the blue dome. Never been blue. But they it never been blue. It. No. The Turks wanted to change the color of the silver dome, yeah. and that is why they made it green in 1839, like 180 yeah. years ago. You can why see do that? you think they call it the blue dome? They made it green. In 1830, yeah. You see the black pot? What, 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 what do you think they call it? The blue dog? I'm not sure. Maybe mm -hmm. the, the reflection? Maybe? Okay. A little bit so, yeah. yeah. Maybe. See the black pole? Yeah. The black pole uh, was like a sundial or a sun wow. clock. The people used to use it all the time. Yes. Yes. All the time, all the time. Yes, yes, yes. Sunset, sunrise, everything. This one here is for King Saul, 1955. So King Saul. Uh, King Saud expanded the mosque from the north side. The mosque became 6,300 square meters. 6, the biggest and the latest, the latest yes. one that we have now. This, one. this is the expansion of King Fahad. Uh -huh. Started in 84 and it ended in 94. So from 84 to 94, that's 10 years. The size of the mosque is 352,000 square million. meters. The capacity is 1 million. Wow. One million. Okay. See, small pot is called Muddin Arab, and the big pot is called Sa. These two actually are measurements. People used to use these two to measure things like grains, you see, barley, wheat. Maybe you them. He used to use this one here to do wudu, to make wudu around 3 or around 7.50, uh, 7.40 milliliters, something like that. So he used to use it, uh, he used to use this amount of water to do wudu. And he used to use one side of water for ghusl. Mm -hmm. So the big one is around 3 liters, the small one is around 7.50. You see, um, you know, like uh, he used to use, yeah, the, the, this amount of water for taking a shower. Yes. You see how much water we're using. And this one here is Aisha's house. Aisha Abdullah had a room and a courtyard. Yes. The graves of Nabi Abu Bakr and Amr are in the courtyard, yes. not in the room. And Nabi said, the prophets of Allah are buried where they die. Mm -hmm. The Sahaba is buried with him in the courtyard because he died there. So this is Hafsa's house, and the other one is for Fatima, the prophet's daughter. So Hafsa's house, Aisha's and Fatmas are now underneath the green dog. You know, 88 years after Hijra, the roof of Aisha came down. Some of the uh, Abdelazis were built to Aisha's house. Some of were built. Okay. Umar bin Abdelaziz, he combined the room, see, he combined the room with the courtyard. So it, be, it like became one room or one chamber. And then he removed Hafsa's house, and Fatmas, he 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 demolished these two, right? Okay, and then he made a five yeah. sided wall around the holy chamber. He didn't make it a four sided wall like the Kaaba because mm -hmm. he was afraid that the people might have the castle well, and was walk around. The five sided wall uh, doesn't have any doors nor windows, mm -hmm. uh, and that means all the pictures on the internet are fake, the graves are sealed up. No one gets in there, not even for maintenance, not even for pain, not even for cleaning. Yeah. Okay, and then about 800 years ago, Abdullah Bieber has made another wall around the five sided wall. He made it to protect the five sided wall. Ten years later, Muhammad Qalim raised the outer wall to match the five sided wall, and he made a small dome on top. 
Now, ladies, do ziyara from here, mm -hmm. and men will do ziyara from there. Right. You see, this is the this is Bab al-Salam. Mm -hmm. So we, we walk past them this way. These are the golden gates they grew up. So when we look through, we'll see the five-sided wall, not the graves. The five-sided wall, or the Pentagon, is covered by a green cloth, yes. a green curtain. So that's when people look at it, they think it's the Prophet's mm -hmm. grave, because it's green, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. See? In 1481, a lightning struck the Prophet's message. See the small dog? Uh -huh. It got burned down. So, uh, like a group of people were chosen to go in there to clean up the holy chamber. Those people were the last people to see the grace. Uh, Some people say only one man was allowed to sit there, Muhammad Samhudi, and he was the last. No one has been there since 1481. Five it's been 538 years. A buyer beavers. Or I just like to rebuild everything. See, he made a second wall of metal caging instead of food. He rebuilt the small dome. He made it to flood so it won't be burnt again. This dome is still there, but we can't see it. Mm -hmm. Any idea why? Um, the green dome now covers yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the green, Allah Shabbat Allah Shabbat built the, 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 remember the blue dome? Mm -hmm. It was silver, so he, he made it in top of that. Right, okay. See, that's it. Then the Turks made it in yes. 1839. Now you can look through these windows and you will see the fire side. Mm -hmm. See, you can look through. Yeah. See, that's that's what you see. See, you can see the wall. Right? Uh, okay. So this that's what you see when you look through. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So what was, you know, how is that? This black. this black thing? Yeah. This is a window for the air to go in. Uh, and okay, yes. This. Okay. Yeah. That one. See, this is the Kankar to Makkah See, in the the Sahabas conquered Makkah They were 10,000. So the Sahabas were 10,000. Uh, they were on their way to uh, Makkah Makkah when Abu Sufyan came and accepted his death. Subhanallah. And then uh, Abu Sufyan and Nabi Abu Sufyan were, they were enemies for over 20 years. But once he accepted Islam, Nabi forgot about all the things that he had done. He immediately accepted them as a Muslim. He honored them by saying those who enters into the house of Yusuf will be safe. And that shows how noble he was. Mm -hmm. And then Nabi Sassam divided his army into six battalions. Each one of them had a flag with a different color. See, green, white, red, black, silver, and beige. Mm -hmm. They were told to enter Mecca through different entrances. People in Mecca, Mecca were taken by surprise. Muslims were everywhere. They couldn't fight back, so they had to surrender. So they had to surrender. And Nabi came and said to the people, what do you think I'm going to do to you? They said, you are the son of our brother Abdullah and you are noble. And Nabi said, go, you are free. And about the idols right there, and Nabi Sassan was pointing his stick at the idols, and the Sahabas were pushing them down. And on top of the Kaaba, that's Bilal Abu Rabaha, he was calling people to say he was made. Okay, and here we have Aisha's house. Aisha, the line, had to see that's her house. It was six by five meters, 30 square meters. So this is the room, and that's the quality of Subhanallah. And Nabi Sassan, you know, Aisha's house uh, had two doors. Mm -hmm. The front door to the masjid yeah. and the back door to the city of Medina. Mm -hmm. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in Aisha's corridor. He literally died in her, in her lap, or the surah the line. So when she was crying, she was screaming, and the bees did, and the bees did. The sahabas in the masjid, they could hear Aisha line crying. So they immediately started crying. Umar al was yelling at the companion, saying, By Allah, Nabi is not dead. He is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will come back and kill all these hypocrites. At that time, Umar al was outside the city. You know, he was running some errands. When he came to the city, he saw the people crying. He knew that something was up. These obvious, that, that's obvious. These people are crying, so something is up. They told him that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died. You know, Nabi Abu Bakr were friends for over 50 years. Like he was the Prophet's best and closest friend. So losing him, that was really tough. That was really hard. But he dealt with it because he knew it was from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He came to the house of Aisha Anha. He uncovered the Prophet's face. He kisses his forehead and then he said, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, you are pure in life and you are pure in death, Ya Rasulullah. Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I will sacrifice my father and my mother for you, Ya Rasulullah. And then he walked into the masjid. In the masjid, Mardan was crying, you know, he was yelling, yeah. saying, Whoever says in the beast that I will yeah. cut his head off or will kill him. Baba he like 
or realized that responsibility. He knew that the Sahabis needed help. So he stood on the memor of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he asked all the Sahabas to gather around him. And this is all people, whoever worships Muhammad, let know that Muhammad has passed away. And whoever worships Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, let know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is ever living and never dies. Umar Adan immediately, like, he immediately dropped his sword. He says, it's like, this is the first time I hear this ayah, and subhanAllah. And that's when he realized that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had really passed away. You see, so the Sahabas washed him with his clothes on, they shrouded him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then they performed salat al janazah individually, one person at a time. And that took them days, and he died on Monday, but he was buried on Wednesday. Wow. After the, you know, after you know, Aisha Radana, she didn't move out with us at the Prophet. She spent the rest of her life in the same house. She used to sleep part of it and be next to the grave. Even after the death of her father, Bakr, she would do the same thing. But after Umar's death, she made that partition. You know why she made it? Because Umar is not related to her. That's true. He's not Mahara. So every time she wants to walk, go in there, she puts on the hijab first. And then she goes in there to give something to the Prophet and her husband. And that shows how respectful and how noble she is. So ladies do ziyarah from me. This is the message, the road. And men, we do ziyarah from here. These are the golden gates. So Nabi is the first one. He is on the right side, in the face, you know, sideways, and the face yes. is the Qibla. So when you stand before the golden gates, you're actually facing his face. Abu Bakr is further down from the Prophet's shoulder all the way down. Amr is great from the shoulder all the way down. The Sahaba made it that way out of respect. Nabi Abu Bakr and Amr. Okay? Any questions about that? And here? This one here? Yeah, let us see. Yeah, that's how yeah. This one here shows the way that we used to bury our people. You recall it a lot. Yeah. See, that's the grave from the inside. Yeah. Take a look at it. Come and see the cavity in there. It's got crevices. Yeah, that's inside. true. Yeah. That's true. So they take the body down. They slide it in. They push it in. Mm -hmm. After that, they cover up the gap with a layer of bricks. And then they fill it up. It becomes mm -hmm. like this. So some of, some of the graves have two stones. Yes. And others have only one. Two for women and one for men. Yeah. Just to indicate that's a lady, this is a man, and so on. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that one is the people that is, you know, after the Prophet had died, the Sahabas had to choose one of them as the Khalif. Okay? And that is why they had that meeting there. They had, they were there, uh, you know, they, they chose Abu Bakr to be the Khalif of the Prophet. It's still there, by the way. It's a small garden mm -hmm. next to gate 15, 15 in the house. Yes, yes. And here, this is a Masjid in the Sharif. And these are, you see, this is a Masjid in the Sharif. And these are the houses of the wives, all of them. This is Hafsa's house, Aisha's, and this one is for Fatma, the Prophet's daughter. So these three houses are now underneath the green dome. The rest are part of the Masjid. Okay? This is Sultan's house, Zainab to Khuzayma's house. She stayed with the Prophet for a few months after her death. Um Salama moved in her house. Zainab bint Jash, Ramla bint Abu Sufyan, Sophia bint Ali, and the last one was Zainab bint Al Hadi. So each house had two doors: the front door to the masjid and the back door to the city. And now you see all the houses are attached to the masjid. Okay, I know uh, Maimuna's, Maimuna's house and Khadija's house were in Mecca. Yeah, yeah. Right behind me, we have the Madinah Munawwara in 1926. The founder took around eight years to finish it. A lot of people participated in building it. Not only that, this model is documented by the Saudi government, and that is why it's 90 percent correct. So this must be received. That's the first wall. Yes. The second one at the back there. And that's the third. These walls had gates. They used to open them after Fajr and close them after Maghrib. So after Maghrib, no one was allowed to enter the city. If somebody had come to Maghrib, he would have waited all night long. You know, back in the twenties, somebody come had if somebody had come to Maghrib. He would have waited. He would have. I would have waited all night. You see that Baqiya? It was outside of the Munawwara. Masjid Ghamana, Masjid Al-Baqir, where the Prophet used to perform Salat Eid. That castle right there is where the Turks and the Yarmans. And this is the translation of the Hijaz, or the, the wheel of the Hijaz. It had two tracks. The first track would go to Istanbul, Turkey. Wow. And the second track would go to Medina. This model has more than 4,009 marks in Medina, including houses, hospitals, universities, schools, playgrounds, graveyards. We have them all here. So this is the end of our tour.